for our first water seminar of the uh, of the year of 2024. Uh, my name is Kevin Wagner. I'm the director of the Oklahoma Water Resources Center, and it's my pleasure to welcome today uh, Dr. Jeff Sadler. Um, Dr. Sadler, he grew up in Utah and completed his BS and MS degrees at uh, Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. He graduated with his PhD from the University of Virginia in Charlottesville, Virginia. And then after his PhD, he spent three years as a postdoc fellow with USGS. Dr. Sadler arrived here in Stillwater this past June and uh, is now an assistant professor and extension specialist in uh, the Department of Biosystems and Ag Engineering. And his studies have focused on the data side of water. So that's what we're gonna hear about today um, and on how to best leverage data through web-based platforms and machine learning and artificial intelligence models. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Sadler. Welcome. Thanks. All right, good to be here. I'm happy to have this opportunity to talk today about this topic that I think is exciting and has some potential to improve our water resources predictions and management um, everywhere. And I'll give some examples of specific things that maybe will, uh, maybe the next steps here in Oklahoma that we can look into. So, um, I think we, let's see if I can get these slides to go. Here we go. Yeah. And I think uh, we, I would say that we live in the most exciting time in the history of the world. Uh, we have the overall, there's, there are a lot of problems, but overall we have uh, some amazing opportunities and technologies that I think we're just starting to tap into. And I think they can, if we think of the smartphone, I think we can look at our smartphones and see those technologies come together in one really amazing device. And that device, what makes it amazing, I think consists of these three different things. So first is the hardware we have miniature computers that we carry around in our hands. So a lot of our smartphones are much better than computers were just a few years ago. And now we have this handheld device that has an amazing screen, amazing processors, uh, enough memory to do a lot of the things that we used to be able to do just with our computers. We have more data than we've ever had before. So if you think about just all the data on the internet, but also when we're thinking about water resources, there's more and more remote sensing data that is becoming available. And those data are not only becoming more available, but also more accessible via different web services and um, and smart ways of aggregating that data. And I'll get into that a little bit later. And the thing that kind of ties these things together are the models that are we're able to glean useful information from the mounds and mounds of data that's being collected now. So there's this kind of hierarchy of data and then information, information to knowledge. And with that knowledge, we can make better decisions. So today I'll talk about a smaller subset of artificial intelligence and how the subset can be applied to water resources, a few applications in water resources. Artificial intelligence, from a broad perspective, you can think of that as human intelligence exhibited by machines. So that's a very kind of visionary statement that we're taking baby steps toward and may never achieve in a broad sense. 
Machine learning is a set of algorithms to parse data and learn patterns from it. So this is a, uh, an approach to start moving toward broader artificial intelligence. And then deep learning is a subset of machine learning. So it's a subset of algorithms. And these are large, many layered neural networks typically trained with large amounts of data. So just setting those definitions out before I dive into more of the details. Deep learning is a subset of machine learning. Machine learning is an approach to try to get to AI or artificial intelligence. I wanted to talk about two different approaches to modeling. So we use models to make predictions or better understand systems. And there's two approaches that I'll talk today. I think you could argue that these are the two main approaches. So one's a process-based or knowledge-driven approach and one's data-driven. In process-based, you start with a model or you start with knowledge. You start with understanding of the system and you encode that knowledge, usually in the form of mathematical equations, which are implemented in computer language, into a computer program. So we go from knowledge to some, so some understanding of how the world works, we go to mathematical equations, mathematical equations to computer code. Then we can put in new inputs into that model and we get predictions. Data-driven modeling kind of flip that, flips that where we start with data, so observations that are recorded in data, and then using that data, the computer makes the model. So the before the we are making the model and giving it to the computer. In this, in data driven, we are giving it the data and the computer is giving us the model. Then we can use that model to then give inputs and make predictions in unseen locations. So here's an example of that getting a little bit more specific. If we think about that approach for predicting run runoff from rainfall, if we're using a machine learning model, we can give it many rainfall events. So let's think about the North Canadian River. So we have, let's say, decades of rainfall records from observations like the mesonet. We give the model a bunch of examples of rainfall events. Then we also give it what happened to the stream flow at that location for each of those events. The algorithm learns the pattern between input and response, so rainfall to runoff, and gives us a model. So then when we have a new runoff rainfall event, let's say before we started recording the data or in the future, then we can make a prediction of what the runoff would be. So we don't know, that's wrong. The prediction's wrong because it's a model. But based on the patterns from the past, we can have some idea of what it might be. I want to give you a few examples of how this has been applied in uh, mostly the rainfall runoff modeling that I think are really landmark, well, at least this one is, and um, and I think really interesting to think about. So 
This is a paper from Freddie Kratzer and some other folks that, that he worked with where they took data from, from 531 basins across the US. So they took daily rainfall data and runoff data across the continental US and trained a single neural network to predict the runoff. So this is pretty, I would say maybe borderline revolutionary, definitely novel in hydrology. Before this paper, there were a bunch of papers using neural networks or other machine learning models or statistical models to, to map that rainfall to runoff relationship. That's not a new concept. But what was interesting here and new is that he took data from 500 basins across the US, so a really big data set, and trained a single network with all of that data to predict runoff. So how could a single month, one of the questions though that I had was how could a single model distinguish between basins? If a single model is learning one relationship between rainfall and runoff, how would that work? So if it rained one inch, for example, here, compared to here, that's gonna have a lot different res uh, response, right? So a large flatter basin with less vegetation compared to a smaller stream with a lot of vegetation. So how could a single model predict either of those? What was really cool, I think, and interesting is that what they did was to distinguish between the basins as input, as model input, they provided the elevation, catchment area, slope vegetation, and other catchment attributes to the model, as well as the dynamic weather related variables. So then the model could learn the relationship not only between rainfall and runoff, but also rainfall and catchment area and runoff and rainfall and slope and vegetation and land cover and all those things in runoff. So that way they were able to make that single model that's learning a generalizable relationship between all of those inputs and outputs. And here's some of the results. So this is the um, this is the NSC. NSC, that's the Nash Sutcliffe efficiency. The, if it has an NSC of one, then the model's perfect. It's kind of like the R squared value. It's comparing the predictions to the observations. And this is predicting when there's, uh, when it hasn't seen the observations, right? So if you look at this, we're comparing the predictions of this global LSTM, that's a deep learning model, to the Sacramento Soil Moisture Accounting model. That's a, a physics-based model or a knowledge-based model. And so anything, so let's look at this point. So the global LSTM got a NSC of close to zero and the Sacramento model got somewhere between negative 2.25 and negative 0.5. So anything below this line, the LSTM is performing better than the Sacramento, the physics-based model. And you can see across the, across the continental US, for the most part, the process-based model is performing a little bit less than the deep learning model. What I think was especially interesting about this case is that if you look at this plot, this is the, um, just focusing on this purple line, this is when they predicted at locations that the model hadn't seen at all. So they left that location out of the training. And if you look at 
the Sacramento model, it's predicting a little bit less, but those are models that were trained specifically at the locations or calibrated specifically at the location. So even the models that were, the physics-based models that were ca calibrated specifically at those locations performed worse than this global LSTM model when that location wasn't even used in the training. So that's suggesting that this has this, this deep learning model that was trained on a lot of different cases is learning some generalizable relationship that can transfer across lots of different basins better than the physics-based model, even when it's calibrated for that specific location. So uh, some possible applications of this concept in Oklahoma, and these two are actually in development currently. One is to improve National Weather Service operational flood forecasts. So currently we're working with the Arkansas Red River uh, Weather Forecast or River Forecast Center, and they issue flood forecasts at different locations in Oklahoma. And at a couple of the, these locations, their process-based model always is performing poorly. And so they have hydrologists on staff that are adjusting those because they know it's not doing the correct mod. They're not correct making the correct forecast. And so they have someone manually adjusting those every time a, a forecast is issued. And uh, what we're trying to do is to see if a machine learning model can learn that pattern. If a human can learn that pattern, right, over the years of experience, then it seems like this machine could learn that and improve those flood forecasts. Another project that we're currently working on is to improve stream flow forecasts to USDA flood control reservoirs. And this is with the USDA and one part of the project that Dr. Wagner is leading. Um, and the question there is, can we use even more data to impr improve the performance of models, such as um, not only lumped, spatially lumped rainfall data, but also spatially resolved rainfall data? Yeah. Uh, so that's all about prediction, which is really important. How about, <clears throat> how about reprediction? So can we use runoff data to estimate how much rainfall we got using machine learning? Yeah, there's no reason you couldn't go the opposite way. Use, you just flip the inputs and outputs. So then you would give the, you would give the model as inputs the runoff and have it try to predict the rainfall. Have you seen any previous papers? I, I know it, the application might not be as widespread, but it would help us understand what has happened in the past. I haven't heard of anything like that. That's an interesting idea. Yeah. Okay, this is a second case study that I wanted to share. I was involved with this when I was at the University of Virginia. And the idea behind this is to train a machine learning surrogate model from a, I'll just read the, the uh, title. So we're training machine learning surrogate models from a high fidelity physics-based model. So we have a physics-based model called TwoFlow, which is a 2D hydrodynamic model. So it's a 2D model and we're modeling this coastal area in a town called Norfolk, Virginia. It's very flat. And to model it, we uh, use two flow, which divides the area into many small cells. Okay. And this, and so the model has to simulate the dynamics of the water in all of the cells. And so it's very computationally expensive. The idea we had was, well, we have these model runs. Can we use that 
those model runs to train machine learning model to be a surrogate, like a, a kind of like a cheap version of this high fidelity model. So one of the things that we would, what was interesting is that we were able to, well, we were able to successfully do this, but in some of the locations, there were some high error places where the random forest, that's the machine learning model. The machine learning model predicted that the rate, the runoff would go a lot, um, excuse me, the water would drain a lot faster than it actually did in the two flow model. That's the high fidelity model. And so we saw, this was one of the examples. We looked here and there was a high error in our machine learning model. So we thought, okay, well maybe the machine learning, maybe the machine learning model is wrong or maybe the physics-based model is wrong. What was interesting is that we went to this location, for example, and on Google Street View and saw that there were these drains here in the infrastructure that actually weren't in the high fidelity model. So in this case, that, that error was actually indicating that there was something wrong in the parameterization of the high fit the high fidelity physics based model we thought this was kind of an interesting application of almost troubleshooting the physics based model to find out where things might be not exactly correct and that needed attention uh, the other advantage of this approach is that on a pretty beefy machine with a GPU, it took the two flow model six hours, four to five, four and a half to six hours to run. We were able to train the, the machine learning model, the random forest model, in about less than an hour. And then once it was trained to take to make any kind of prediction it took only a few seconds. Okay. So you lose some of the um, detail and because we're not able to, let's, let's say the training data is pretty limited, right? Cause it's so expensive to get those training data, but, but at least for a use case that's, or an event that's similar to what we've already seen, it would only take a few seconds then to make new predictions. Um, so one possible application, and this would take a, a lot of work to get the actual hydrodynamic model running. So that still has to happen, but um, that could be used to improve hydrodynamic modeling in urban settings. And especially when time is sensitive for like uh, early warning or uh, emergency response, you could have that surrogate running all the time once that is established. I wanna pause here and talk about some advantages and disadvantages of data-driven modeling versus knowledge-driven. So in knowledge driven, some of the advantages are that it's consistent in time and space. Meaning that no matter when we're uh, making predictions, those equations are always gonna behave the same way. You don't need much data because you're relying on the equations and it's always physically realistic most of the time, I guess. So the times when it's not is that sometimes these models get over, over parameterized and in the calibration of them, they can, those parameters be, can become meaningless because they're just trying to fit the observations. Some of the disadvantages is that we don't know everything. We, we have 
uh, some understanding of how these systems work, but we can't capture all of the behavior in our mathematical models. And even if we could, those models need so many parameters that we wouldn't be able to parameterize them correctly because we just can't observe those things. And, and um, the other problem with trying to make such a complex model is that there are computational limitations, right? Let's, if we did want to model, let's say even just a few square feet of a hydrodynamic model, you could infinitely zoom in and still not resolve those small changes if you're trying to um, get it exactly right. And that's only a few square feet, not, not to mention like an entire city. Some advantages of a data-driven approach is that you don't need much knowledge. I guess that could be a disadvantage too. Um, you are learning directly from observations and you can learn these dynamic nonlinear behaviors. And we're also limiting the human bias. So it's when we have the uh, physics-based models, it's one person that is interpreting the system or based on a, on a group of people, but you're still have this human in the loop that's making decisions about how it's implemented in computer code or um, how the or how the parameters or the different versions of the equations are used. Another advantage which we saw in the previous case study is that they run quickly after training. Some disadvantages is that they need plenty of data. And there's this is the big one is this, there's no tie to physical realism. So for example, there's nothing that would prevent a model from predicting negative stream flow. The last thing I wanted to talk about for this, um, this concept of machine learning is the idea of process guided deep learning. So this is where we combine the advantages of both deep learning and process understanding. And we call that process guided deep learning. This is from a uh, colleague that I had at the USGS. What they did was they used this approach to predict lake water temperature in some lakes in Wisconsin and Minnesota. And I'll show you some results in just a second. We're looking at training temperature profiles. So they have some observation of uh, temperature along the profile, the depth profile of the lake. And they're using different amounts of those observations to either calibrate the process-based model or to train the deep learning model. So the process-based model, as you increase the, um, as you increase the, as you increase the number of observations that it's calibrated on, the performance increases. So we're looking at test RMSE, but the scales different. So the higher you go, the lower the numbers are and the better the performance. When you use a deep learning model, it's worse here. Right? The process-based model only needs a few um, observations to calibrate to an acceptable level of performance. But the deep learning model, it doesn't have any understanding of temperature or lakes for that matter. 
And so without any, without, without many observations, it doesn't know how to perform. What was interesting in this finding was that the process guided deep learning model does better when there's fewer data points and also does better when there's more data points. How did they incorporate the process understanding? So one was that they use this time where model where the previous observation, sorry, the previous um, time steps could affect today's time step. They use the energy budget constraint. So they penalize the model for making physically impossible predictions. And then they also pre-trained the model with a, a physics-based or process-based model. So they had a process-based model. They made a bunch of synthetic observations, observations, and they used those to kind of seed the deep learning model. So it had a better starting point before it saw the real observations. I think in Oklahoma, this could be an approach that we use to make water quality and or quantity models for our lakes and streams. All right, the last example I wanted to show is this. This is chat GPT yesterday. Have you guys used the analyst, the data analyst plugin? Okay, so I did this yesterday. I'm so I have this um, Oklahoma Mesonet Corners data set where I took I downloaded daily data from the four corners. So the Panhandle is one corner, and then Idabel, Miami, and Hollis for the period of records, so from 1994 till last year um, when I downloaded it. And so I'm asking ChatGPT to look at the average annual rainfall at these um, locations. So I upload the CSV file. And then I say, please tell me the annual average rainfall at the stations in this file. I'm not giving it any other information. So it says, great, you've uploaded this file. I'll begin by examining the contents of the file. And I'll click in here in just a second, but it actually shows you the code. Oh, I, I guess I do that, let me see. So the file contains several columns, and so it's interpreting the columns. The rain column seems to be the one we're interested in. To calculate the average rainfall, we will group the data by year and station ID. It figured out station ID, STID is a station, and then calculating the sum of each year. So you can see the code that it's writing too. And then here's the, the average annual rainfall in those stations. And then I'm asking it to make a bar plot of that. So it's writing code and executing it. And then it can also give us the output for that. Now, I have to say, one of the times I asked it, it didn't do the calculation right. It just, it didn't sum it by year. It just took the average, I guess, daily rainfall across all the years. Well, maybe you didn't, you didn't say it, please. <laughs> yeah. This is awesome. So I think this could be, um, you know, if we give it, so I don't exactly know how this works, but you can create your own chat GPT with your own data. 
So I could definitely imagine this being like, there would be like an Oklahoma Mesonet GPT, like tell me the wettest week for the state in the past 15 years, or Oklahoma Hydronet GPT, like please tell me the driest area of the state right now based on soil moisture, lake levels, and groundwater levels. Um, again, you have to check that it's doing the right thing because it doesn't always do the right thing. Um, so just a few points on the limitations of machine learning models. So we need a lot of data and in, um, in our fields, speaking in water, I guess in particular, we have a lot more data than we used to have, but we still don't have as much as a lot of the amazing breakthrough machine learning applications have. For example, like image processing, ChatGPT used all of the texts on the internet to be trained. We don't have that kind of data. Um, and so that, in my experience, has been a limiting factor. Now, I think there's ways to get around that and help that, but we're still limited and it takes some more creativity. We can't just shove a bunch of data into the models because we don't have that much. Um, what I've experienced and I've seen is that a lot of the time, so maybe we're not writing equations into computers, but a lot of the time spent in these approaches is managing, curating, massaging, what we can refer to as data janitoring, right? You just have to, there's a lot of uh, maintenance that goes into just keeping the data sets. Um, and many times I've missed a step or two and got a model that is berserk because I forgot to do one step. And that's good because I could find it, but there's probably other times where you miss something small and the model is close to what you want it and it's not as obvious. And that's even a little bit scarier. Um, computational power is another uh, bottleneck. A lot of these big models require, if there's any kind of, uh, if you wanna do it in a feasible amount of time, you need GPUs and GPUs are pretty expensive. Um, the hallucinating thing, if we're talking about generated, generative AIs, is also a concern because you don't, it doesn't know when it's wrong and it's very confident either way. Yeah, so you have to, um, so you have to have some knowledge, right? Like if I gave, if I told my undergraduates to do that problem, they wouldn't bat an eye in submitting a bar chart showing 0 .0, 0 0.16 inches of rainfall in Idabel for an annual average. They went, so you have to know something and think critically. And the last thing I think that we need to think about moving forward is, and it kind of gets back to the computational power and time and everything is accessibility. So to use this data analyst on ChatGPT, you have to be a plus member. So that's $20 a month or $16 if you wanna pay annually, $16 a month if you wanna pay annually, um, which you know isn't a crazy amount of money, but it, I think it is a barrier for a lot of people. Um, and I think as we move forward, and this is you know above, I'm not sure what we can do as a community to address this, but I just see that there's so much power concentrated into a few organizations that um, if we become dependent on this, we're, um, we're vulnerable to have to do what they want to do. Um, so. Along those, those lines, the the water, the one that they looked at the 351 watersheds. Yeah. Uh, I'm assuming you can't see what the algorithm was. You're dependent on their model 
but you still need your own data to go into that model. Is that am I getting that correct? Um, you can. Uh, so they posted their their uh, the code they use to train their you model. Actually, it actually produces a code that you, you can read. <clears throat> well, but as it, I guess it doesn't give you to you in like physical parameters. I'm, I'm yeah, the model is kind of like it produces a black box. Yeah, all the and you can see what the parameters are, but it's you got to use your black boxes. Yeah, it's very difficult to interpret or get, glean any meaningful information from so those you need parameters. Their black box, and then you need your data to go into their black box. Yeah, if you want to use their data, then you use their black box. You can see all the code they use to train their black box, but they don't even know what's in their black box. That's what. I'm yeah. 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 It's, it's completely in within that machine to, to come up with this relationship. Yep. We can't. I guess what I'm saying is you can't take that machine learning and turn it back into a process-based model. Not that I, I think that's an interesting idea. I've, so uh, there, I have seen uh, some research where they, but so usually in like you know, how much I do with the bar, the process-based models are often fundamentally a set of differential equations, yeah. right? And so I saw a study where they said, uh, here are some variables. Here are all possible derivatives of those variables. And they asked the machine learning to figure out which derivatives, in fact, made up the governing equation. And so they used machine learning to try to create a physics-based model. That's a very creative approach. Yeah. I haven't seen much of that yet. Uh, that's it's, it's pretty hard to do that. Oh, that's cool. The process. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. That's interesting. Yeah, that's and it sort of worked. Yeah. Yeah. yeah sort of. <laughs> <laughs> but it didn't come to exactly the physically based model we yeah. expected. It was a little bit different. Well, a lot of the in soil physics, a lot of physically based models. Yeah. I mean, they're all they'll, they'll work. They're all empirical and they. All have the same reality, but they don't use the same form. So actually, machine learning may be better. Yeah. Right. Is it any worse to just say, "Here's some data. You find the relationship," compared to compared to the last you know, hundred years of people worrying about water capillary relationships? Yeah. I don't know. So um, I guess in conclusion, I still think we live in the most exciting time in history. There's a lot of opportunities, um, but there are a lot of challenges. There, this isn't a magic wand that solves all of our problems. And I think in, in which, how do I say this? Rather than AI taking away our need to think, I think it makes us, forces us to think even more critically because we have this tool now and we have to figure out how to use it in a correct way. And so maybe it takes away some of the grunt work, but it pushes us to do what we can only do which is to think critically and creatively and in a big picture. And uh, those are things that AI won't do. I like this. Uh, this is the Oklahoma State slogan, labor omnia vincit, labor conquers all. And um, machines conquer labor. So, Machines got girl. <laughs> All right. Thank you. We have time for questions um, online as well. So, uh, if there's any questions. Well, for me, this is absolutely fascinating. I am not up to speed on all the, the latest and greatest um, 
And, and I felt like it's a real deficiency um, that, that I have, and probably a, a lot of people could say across campus, you know, beyond um, a lot of shortcomings were on this. Um, any advice on, you know, good places to, to start, you know, is there like a machine learning for dummies, or, <laughs> <laughs> or are you going to be teaching a class like that? <laughs> Is this morning? Uh, uh, this afternoon, yeah. Yeah. I am teaching uh, machine learning for natural and agricultural systems, which is a grad level class. Um, I this semester. This semester, yeah. Yep. I think that's a great opportunity for the students. Um, just from what you're talking about, um, I mean, it's going to have applicability, you know, across every single sector. Yeah. So it's being used right now. Right. So all the students really need to be exposed to this. I um as far as like a tutorial. Yeah, it's hard to it's hard to get into without really getting into it. Oh yeah. <laughs> um you you might check out I I actually this the Kratzer. I don't know why the ST is so small. Um, Kratzer and all those folks, they made a, a kind of cool website. It's called Neural Hydrology. These guys. Neural Hydrology. And actually, most of these, I know Kratzer, I know Nearing. They, these guys work for Google now. Oh, wow. They, they do their Google Flood program. They're part of that, which is an interesting program. They're like selling their product, I think, to Bangladesh, the government of Bangladesh, where they're trying to help them with their flood um, forecasts. Um, we have a cat or a question here on the chat saying we are experimenting with layering GIS. And chat GTP, are you aware of any matchup on that? No, I well, I saw when I was researching a little bit for this, I saw an example where someone took um, spatial data, it was like population data, including lat and long, and then they just told this analyst tool to make them an in, interactive graphic of that and it had like different size bubbles for the different populations and so like the facial features eye color and that sort of thing uh no 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 just like uh population numbers oh okay. like um uh, how many people per country okay. um but it, um oh i see yeah i don't see why count of noses no what? Counting noses, like you used to say. Yeah, counting noses, yeah. I don't know. Uh, I guess my question would be, you know, both that and the example I just gave was like plain text data. I don't know what it would do if you gave it like a, a binary file, like a shape file. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. That's a cool idea, though. They commented that the example you gave was the direction they were working in. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I would suggest they just they just give it like a try a shape file. If that doesn't work, then convert it to like GeoJSON, which is a, a text based file, and see if it will be able to do that. It should be able to and if it's not GeoJSON, then CSV with the lat and long and they should be able to get something. We have another question that says, can we use machine learning or AI to predict the extremes in weather and hydrology? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, because the extremes, there's fewer examples of, and so the, the algorithms have a harder time picking those out and predicting them correctly. I don't know of a way to do that in a in a really good way. One example that I was a collaborator on is they were predicting, trying to predict extremes in water temperature. 
So water temperature, it can't really get that extreme. Like in natural settings, it gets up to maybe like 30 degrees, right? Um, and gets down to zero. Now, the way they did it is they they had two models. They had a model that said, is this extreme? Is this going to be an extreme? Let me let me back up. They had three models. They had a model to predict it for the extreme values. They had a model to predict when it wasn't extreme. And then they had a model to predict if it's going to be extreme or not. So the inputs would come in. The first model would say, it's going to be extreme. So then use this model for the actual prediction. So there was some kind of like hierarchical thing, but, and it was pretty successful, but like I said, I, there's got to be some, we would have to learn more about that approach and try it out for stream flow, which can really spike. You know, in, in my lifetime, I've watched weather prediction get better and better and better. Yeah. And I'm, they use a huge process-based models. Are yeah. any of them using more machine learning type models these days? Like the NCIS, whatever the climate center is. I don't know for sure, but I'd be willing to guess they are at least looking into it. I don't know if they're looking, if they, I don't know if they're using it for operational, like published forecast, but. Could be. I don't, do you know, Jason? I'm not aware of any operational use. I'm sure the research is going to. There is a, in water forecasting, the uh, NRCS, uh, what's that called, that makes the seasonal forecast out in Oregon, the mm -hmm. national, I don't know, whatever. The NRCS has to make seasonal forecasts for the Western U.S. by congressional mandate. And they recently updated their process to include a machine learning model, hmm. which is now operational. Okay. Uh, is it? But I don't know that it's the only model. Okay. So one of the approaches they use. Yeah. But previously, they used a statistical approach. Yeah. So they never used a process approach in the first place. Okay. Uh, so it was easier maybe to make that switch. Mm -hmm. But when you built all of these huge, huge, huge infrastructure for these project based yeah. models, you would almost be, you might feel like you're throwing all that away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's I think that's what if Google Upstart was yeah. taking over, you know, they started doing it and, and then all these smoke, you know, huge government based models. Here's the, the other one that I really am interested in and you know, you showed kind of two types of models. Yeah. Uh, one where you have a conception of the process, and then you drive it with inputs and get outputs. The other one's totally database. Yeah. But one I think is really interesting is all of the data assimilation type approaches. Yeah. Where you can have a relatively simple conceptual model of the uh -huh. system, mm -hmm. which is not ever going to like make great long-term predictions. But if you have real time data coming in, you can <laughs> update it and you like keep correcting it as you go. Yeah. And you can get some of the benefits of both. You get a very fast runtime model mm. that it doesn't ever get so far off. That's so, what made me think of the weather model because they have immediate you know, verification of the results. Yeah. So they can bring that back to the loop and improve the model. We actually have done that same thing where we because the models we use have their own states in them, yes. like a process-based yeah. model where we updated the states based on the observations. This was for a water temperature, yeah. water temperature forecast. Right. So there's a memory there. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Any other questions or any more online? Not online. All right. Let's give Jeff another hand. Yeah. So we hope uh, you'll be able to join us next month. Who do we have coming up next month? Oh, we have uh, Dr. Prem Bikina uh, will be joining us uh, next month. So should be a, a great talk on produced water treatment. So thank you again. 